Welcome, everyone. Uh, I think to give a little bit of context, because we actually have a mixed group who's joined us here today. So uh, this is, we already have 83 participants here, which is really for the museum, the largest program that we've put together in this format. So bear with us a little. The majority of our, our group today are part of Windjammers Unlimited, the organization that is dedicated to the history and legacy of the circus band. Uh, so we welcome you all. For our members and other guests who may not know, this time of the year in Sarasota and any other year is Circus Month. And uh, one of the best things about working at the museum is that throughout the month of January, I see friends and familiar faces flowing into our galleries and into my office as they come into town for many different events, one of which is the, the winter gathering of Windjammers. And so this panel discussion came about because we can't host you here at the museum. Uh, what we had originally discussed with Jim Reutz, who I hope has been able to join us today because he's really helped pull this all together, was having a, a, one of the traditional concerts on the museum grounds. And when that became evident that it was just not possible, we started talking about what kind of program we could host that would give a benefit to more of our museum community to help understand and learn more about just the rich history of circus music. Uh, and selfishly, I was really interested in this because I'll be honest, I'm really good at a lot of circus history, but music is not my strongest suit. I did not grow up in a household that, that was really familiar with making music and with musical instruments. So it's an area that I have a lot to learn uh, and there was no better way to learn about it than to bring in a, a, a couple of other circus historians who know so much more and can tell us so much about it. And so that's the panel here today. Um, I'm gonna very quickly introduce my, my two co-panelists for this, for this session. And then I'm gonna give a little bit of an intro on my part and then hand it off. We'll be talking in a couple of segments and then towards the end, we plan to have time for a little bit of discussion between the three of us. And I, I think even then we invite you to join in. And then if there are questions that the audience has at the end, we'll open up for that. Along the way, I know Laura is always very kind about monitoring our chat. So if there's a question that's really pertinent to a specific thing in a moment, feel free to type it in there and Laura will let us know if there's something we need to share. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce the two that are gonna share all kinds of wonderful information with us today and help us learn more about the history of the circus band and contextualize its importance uh, in American culture and, and to the history of live performance. So I'm joined today by Dr. Charles Conrad. Charles is the music director of the Indiana Wind Symphony, which he actually was the founder of as well. He holds a bachelor's in trumpet performance and then a master's and a doctorate in conducting, uh, which he, he got his doctorate from Ball State University. And he wrote his dissertation on Frederick Jewell, who was a, a wonderful, talented bandmaster and composer. Uh, Jewell was part of the Barnum and Bailey Circus for a period of time, and, and his influence is much broader than that. So Charles came to, to the topic of circus history from his interest in music, but really dug right in. As I mentioned, he founded the Indiana Wind Symphony in 1997, and it's currently the resident ensemble at the Palladium uh, in, uh, at the Performing Arts Center, right, in yes. Indiana. And he is known for giving historical presentations about circus music and other music, as well as conducting across North America and Europe. So welcome, Charles. He's going to give us some overview of history in a couple of minutes. And then we're also joined by Don Covington. Uh, and, and this is a, a wonderful balance because Don's background, he, he wasn't a circus man in his first career. He had a wonderful career in the U.S. Navy. He retired as a captain after 30 years of service. Uh, he was a naval air aviator and a naval attache in Paris. So again, a really broad experience there. But throughout all of that, his interest in music and circus kind of helped guide Don's life. And once he retired, he moved on to working with circuses such as the Big Apple Circus and the, the Youth Circus, Fern Street Circus in San Diego as company manager and working behind the scenes to organize these shows. So he brings a lot of knowledge about the, the logistics of circus and music. 
And Don is current president of Windjammers Unlimited. He's also the president of the Circus Historical Society and a past president of the Circus Fans Association of America. So he really bridges many organizations in their pursuit to, to continue circus legacy and to share circus history. And I'm thrilled to have them both here with me today. They have been marvelously sporting about taking on this panel. So um, I'm gonna back up now a little bit as to why I selfishly wanted to do this. A few years ago, I was giving a tour to a group of music students from a local high school. And I don't know a great deal about the band, but I knew enough to be able to tell these students that the band was without doubt the hardest working performers on the circus lot because their day started with a parade and then they were playing two different performances. And in the era of the late 19th and early 20th century, those included band concerts prior to the circus performance itself. And perhaps at times concerts after the show as well. So throughout the day, they were playing music and keeping the tempo of the whole circus lot. And when it comes down to it really, circus is about engaging all of the senses. So I wanted to start out our program today by sharing a, a great video that I was thrilled to find so that you can get a sense of what happens if we don't have the music with us. So this video is the 1899 Barnum and Bailey Circus Parade in England. If you, as you watch the screen, you'll see 40 horses parading to pull the Five Graces bandwagon. So here we can see it for um, those of you who don't know that the Five Graces is part of the collection at the Ringley Museum. It is it is one of the most special wagons in our collection and one that I'm, I'm very proud that we have. But you can see from seeing a video like that, that history doesn't really come to life unless you can bring all of the senses to it. Now for the museum, this is a real challenge for historic circus because while we can find film clips like this, in that time period, audio, audio wasn't being recorded. Uh, and even we find it's difficult to find clips filmed under the big top because lighting was so poor that you don't see it. Um, so history becomes this one, one dimensional interpretation where we can see the images. I can, I can tell you it's the five graces, but I cannot convey to the average audience what it means when 40 horses are clomping down a cobblestone street with a wonderful brass band uh, blowing horns on top uh, as they parade for miles through a town. To counter that, and we're going to cross our fingers that this time around I'm going to do a better job of sharing what happens when groups like Windjammers and others um, perform their magic, bringing history to life. There we go. This is the Great Circus Parade. This was the last one that was staged in Milwaukee in 2009. <laughs> So you get a sense of what happens when the music is there and only live performers can do that. Playing canned music off the top of that bandwagon would not begin to recreate the magic of the circus experience. And so to that end, being able to bring in live musicians and understand more about it is helpful to us who are interpreting history in, in telling that story in a more robust way. As I mentioned, I am not the specialist in doing these kinds of things. And so I've asked for this next part of our program for Charles to give us a, an overview about the history and development of the band in the American circus. So Charles, I'm gonna hand it over to you. All right, thank you so much, Laura. I think before I start my prepared remarks, I wanna go back just a little bit to that uh, 1899 uh, Barnum and Bailey bandwagon. You mentioned the 40 horses. Um, Jake Posey was the driver 
of that of the Five Graces bandwagon, and he was just as well known as most of the big stars in the circus because that was considered such a feat at the time. I saw the uh, bass drum on the back, and that was probably the most famous of all circus bass drummers, Hank Young. Um, and we had quite a number. Russell Alexander, one of the great composers, was playing euphonium in that band. Uh, Carl Clare was the conductor. And just a quick story, from that we get the most famous circus march, which in America is called uh, Thunder and Blazes. It was originally written as Entry of the Gladiators, and it came out in 1897, which was the year that Barnum and Bailey went to Europe. It would have been, it was written by a Czech bassoonist bandmaster in the German army who was stationed in Italy, of all things, Julius Fucic. And it would have been done at a very slow German um, band uh, tempo, something like by the time the Barnum and Bailey Circus came back, it got published in America under a new title and of course sped up quite a bit. So my theory is Carl Clare heard that in performance while the circus was in Europe and decided that that was just going to be a great circus march if we put, if we pulled the tempo from maybe 106 up to about 144 or so. So that so that's what happened in that uh, five year trip to, to Europe by Barnum and Bailey. Now let's go back uh, a little over a hundred years. 1793 is the first mention of a circus band in the United States. And it's the Ricketts Circus in Philadelphia. It was a five piece band conducted by Mr. Young. And that's all we know about them. We don't know what the instruments were, um, anything about them. We do know that President George Washington came to one of the shows in Philadelphia and, and saw that circus. In 1794, the Thomas Swan Circus advertised a band and singers. So this probably was the first time we had vocal music and certainly not the last in a circus. By 1810, the Pepin and Breschlin Circus was advertising a 10-piece band. And by 1820, it was common to have much larger bands. Uh, at this point, in terms of transportation availability, it was mostly wagon and horseback. And um, they were small groups that uh, of circus. I'm sorry, I, I just lost the... Uh, can you all still hear me and see me OK? We can see you, yeah. Okay, it went off on my screen, but that's okay. I don't need to see it. Um, they were they were mostly local bands that were pre-existing musicians that were uh, traveling with the circus. Now, in the in 1822, an instrument made its appearance with the circuses, and it really was the instrument that kind of got the star circus musician off and, and to a start. And this was called the keyed bugle. And it's an instrument that was the predecessor of the cornet and was in its heyday from about 1820 to about 1860. And here is a keyed bugle. This is an E flat keyed bugle made by Graves and Company in Boston in 1841, and it's, it's been restored back to original appearance and playing condition. You notice it's made out of copper rather than uh, brass as the modern instruments would be. And I'm just gonna play a couple notes to show you what this sounded like. <laughs> So you can hear it's a very soft, mellow sound. The most famous keyed bugler of all time was Ned Kendall. And um, he was a superstar in the 1840s and 50s uh, throughout America. And you would see photographs of him in newspapers in the 1850s and 60s with great regularity. 
Um, by the 1840s, you really had the star soloists starting to appear and be featured with the circuses. The first known piece of circus sheet music comes about in 1847, and that was written by E.K. Eaton, who was the bandmaster for the Sands Lent and Company Circus, and it was Les Gymnastes Waltz. Um, so we know that at that point, composers were writing for specific circuses and perhaps for specific acts. We know that by the 1860s, we have music being written based on the pacing of the act and the action that was going on in, on, in the circus. In the 1840s, Dan Rice, who some people believe is the um, inspiration for Uncle Sam, was a great circus first clown, second raconteur, and then third circus owner. He introduced opera on horseback into the circus and, op and drama as well. So we start this incorporation of other arts into the circus way back in the mid-1840s. In the 1880s, William Sweeney, who was Buffalo Bill's bandmaster for the majority of the time that that show was on the road, was credited with the popularization of the Star Spangled Banner because he used it as the overture to their opening uh, concert of the show for many years. And eventually, of course, decades later, it became uh, the national anthem in the 1930s. Now, in the 1890s, we started to have singers with circus bands. And the most important and famous name here was a guy named Bert Morphy. And he was known as the singer who sang to beat the band. And he evidently was a very robust and powerful tenor that sang opera as well as popular music with circus bands. Now to the center ring concert, and this is going to be, uh, I think you have a, a slide of the Liberati band, Jennifer. And I don't see it, but I trust everybody else is. Let me try. Did that, ha did that change anything with me? You're still hearing me okay. You can still see and hear you just fine. Yeah. Okay, terrific. Well, for some reason I've lost the uh the video of it but i'll i'll keep going now by this time the dominant instrument for the circus band is the cornet and it's taken the place of the key bugle and here is an e flat cornet it's a little bit smaller than the most common one the modern b flat this is the one that most of the circus band masters played because it was higher up in the register and it's got a much brighter and bigger sound. This one was made in the mid 1800s uh, in Philadelphia. It's a J.W. Pepper. Now, the center ring concert was really started in the probably early 1890s, but in 1895, the Ringling Brothers um, hired Alessandro Liberati and his famous Italian touring concert band to perform along with their circus band who was conducted uh, that year by William Weldon. And that was a band that was on a par with John Philip Sousa or any of the great touring concert bands. So it really added a new bonus to attending the circus. You would get to go hear a concert for the hour before the circus opened that would rival any that you would go hear in an auditorium or an opera house. And so when this happened, um, there was much more exchange of culture in terms of classical music 
in terms of early Broadway. Remember, this is before we have recording. Radio's not going to be invented for another 25 years. And most major, most major cities on the East Coast had an orchestra. Most others did not. For instance, in my hometown of Indianapolis, the Indianapolis Symphony was not founded until 1930. So to hear cultural presentations, it was mostly touring concert bands that presented classical music. And it seems strange to think that most people heard Beethoven first in a concert band rather than an orchestra, but it's absolutely true once you get west of the Allegheny Mountains. Um, I know one stat that uh, still blows me away when, uh, the, for, like the first time I heard it, the last opera that uh, Richard Wagner wrote was Parsifal. And it was performed uh, in portions by a touring band with John Philip Sousa in Rapid City, uh, 10 years before it ever premiered at the Metropolitan Opera in New York. So you talk about being on the cutting edge, uh, the, the touring bands were right there and the circus bands were very important. Now I'm going to read, this is the repertoire of one of the Ringling Brothers bands from right about the time that they went on tour. So as far as overtures, you will recognize some of these composers. We have Yelva by Reisinger, Norma by Bellini, Schubert by Suppe. I don't know that opera, but I'm sure it was interesting. Zampa by Harold, Nabucco by Verdi, Idealistic by Brooks, which I think was a band overture. Now here are grand selections from operas. From Verdi, we have Attila, I Lombardi, ba, uh, Masked Ball, Ballo on, in Mascera, and Ernani. So four different Verdi operas that this band would play selections from during their center ring concerts. From Bizet, we had Carmen. We had Norma by Bellini, Lucia de Lammermoor by Donizetti, and Faust by Gounod. So quite a variety, but not just that, we had these from comedy opera hits and early Broadway shows. King Dodo, Floridora, The Jolly Musketeer, The Casino Girl, The Chaperones, The Explorers, Sand Toy, A Runaway Girl, and The Burgomaster. And then characteristic, descriptive, and other things. We had Souvenir of Beethoven, In the Cathedral, Spring Morning, the Finale from Ariel, Providence, A Sacred Fantasia, The Holy City, I Love Thee, Columbia, Hail to the Spirit of Liberty by John Philip Sousa, and Columbus by Herman. So that was a pretty extensive repertoire. Now, obviously, in a 45-minute concert, they wouldn't get around to all of those. So how did the audience know what pieces they were playing? In the big circuses, they were all in the program that people purchased when they came into the show and they were numbered. So what they would do is have one of the girls on horseback ride in front of the band holding up a sign with a number on it and that was to alert the audience which piece they were hearing and then they could go to their program and see exactly which one it was. So the center ring concert continued well into the 1930s. And some of the things I mentioned a couple minutes ago really eliminated the need for, for such a thing. Uh, radio, recordings, um, player pianos that lots of people would have and they would buy rolls of classical music and play them at home. Um, it's even possible now for conductors to have George Gershwin play Rhapsody in Blue with their ensemble. And the way you do that is he recorded the piano roll back in the early 1930s of him playing the solo to Rhapsody in Blue. And I've actually seen performances of it done that way. Let's see, so going on, 
the circus started to be one of the big methods for introduction of music such as ragtime and jazz. Now, a lot of this was done by the sideshow bands. And the sideshow bands were generally either African American or Italian. Uh, occasionally, they were women. And a lot of times, they would feature the latest popular hits. And um, some of the most famous, um, I'm, now I'm forgetting where, where I was. Uh, well, uh, Ragtime was introduced in 1897, is considered uh, the official starting time for that form of music. And by, by 1900, it was an absolute staple of the sideshow band and was starting to appear in the center ring, uh, the, the main uh, big top band as well. Then jazz, as it became popular, became important too. Now, um, a few of the people, once we get to 1900, who are important as bandmasters. I'll start with Fred Jewell, who was from Worthington, Indiana. Here is a photo of Fred as the bandmaster of Barnum and Bailey in 1908. And then here is his last year as a circus bandmaster. This is 1917 with Hagenbach Wallace. And of course, he left the circus at probably the right time because a year later was the famous train accident with the Hagenbach Wallace Circus. So he, he just barely missed that. Now, um, other important musicians who were also circus bandmasters were Carl King, Eddie Wachner was uh, one of the big ones to introduce jazz in the 1920s to the circus. And the most famous was Merle Evans, who was the bandmaster for the Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey Circus from the time that they combined the two shows for 50 years, uh, all the way up until 1860, I'm sorry, 1969. He wasn't that old. Um, and it is estimated and I have no reason to doubt that this is true, that he may be the entertainer in the history of the world that has performed for more live people in audiences than anybody else. Because when you think about how many shows in 50 years with the Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey Circus, two a day often, sometimes three uh, on Saturdays, um, you know, that's, that's an amazing number of people. It's somewhere up around 150 million, I think was the title, was, was the number that I read someplace. And how are we doing, Jennifer, time-wise? You are doing great, Charlie. I think we can start wrapping up. I'm actually gonna jump in because I was, as you were talking, I have a picture of Merle Evans, but I, ah, didn't, want, I didn't want to interrupt you because oh, well, everyone is fascinated. <laughs> so um, you're, you're doing great, but I think if you can wrap up a little, then we'll, we'll keep going and we can talk some more. Okay, so they're looking at Merle Evans. Oh. Merle, Merle mm -hmm. was from Kansas and um, he started out with the with the the really smallest uh, of vaudeville shows, and it was really a surprise that he got the job with Barnum and Bailey. At the time, the Ringling Brothers had owned both circuses since 1907, and ran them separately. The Barnum and Bailey show was based in New York in Madison Square Gardens, and the Ringling Brothers was based in Chicago. And uh, at the time, they had two of the most significant composers, musicians, and bandmasters. Uh, Carl King was the bandmaster for the Ringling Brothers Circus, and J.J. Um, Richards was the uh, bandmaster with Barnum and Bailey. And they offered the job to both of them. They both turned it down. Uh, Carl King, because his wife wanted to get off of the road, 
And true to, to his word, he did leave the circus uh, at the at the time in 1919 and became the bandmaster in Fort Dodge, Iowa. J.J. Richards left as well and became a significant bandmaster, ended his career with the famous Long Beach Municipal Band. Um, and so they hired Merle Evans and it turned out to be precisely the right choice because he was known as much known as anybody except for the Ringling Brothers in, in terms of that circus for the next 50 years. So I'll uh, wrap up at that point. Um, if anybody has questions, I'm happy to answer them. As far as playing in a circus band, I don't have a lot of experience, but I have a little. I played uh, in the band from in um, the Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey when it visited Indianapolis from about 1974 till when they stopped using local bands. I think it was 1986. And I also played in the Shrine Circus bands. Um, now I, I just missed Merle Evans, um, but I did get to play a couple times under his successor, who was Bill Prine. So I'll I'll stop there and be happy to answer any questions. I think if it's okay, what we'll do is hold the questions for just a little longer, unless there's okay, something sure. really specific. And because um, that's a wonderful transitional point, uh, Merle Evans. For those of us who are not as as well versed in circus music history, but but know something about the Sarasota history scene. Merle Evans is the name that we associate with circus music um, at, at the museum. We're, we're fortunate to have some records related to him and um, we have lots of photographs and, and lots of material that um, ties back to his time because he was here in this community and part of the circus community that settled in Sarasota. Uh, and, and I think he really enriched this community's understanding. And I, I loved listening to you, Charlie. I learned so much and it speaks to me exactly about what it is that Windjammers Unlimited seeks to do. Uh, you, you are a musician first, but an educator all the way through. You know, the, the information that you shared enriches both my understanding of circus history, but also of music history. And so I wanted to, to do a segue here and bring Don in because we wanted to give a little background. I know many of you are wind jammers, so you know a lot about the organization. I, I wanna take a moment and acknowledge that you all are celebrating your 50th anniversary as, as an organization dedicated to circus music history. Uh, and so Don, do you wanna give us a little background and, and tell us a little bit about the wind jammers? Certainly, I, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Jennifer, for inviting us to do this. Um, wind jammers started in 1971. 50 years ago. It was uh, begun by a group of circus fans who were concerned that circus music was beginning to disappear from uh, the shows that were on the road at the time. Uh, they were able to encourage a group of circus musicians who uh, mostly uh, some active, some retired, to get together and preserve what they felt was a very important part of the circus and American history. So Windjammers began as a very small group of people and grew rapidly uh, into an organization today that has several hundred members, uh, many of them musicians, others historians, circus enthusiasts of all stripes. And um, it continues to uh, have the same mission that it did back in 1971, which was to preserve, to encourage, and to perform traditional circus music. Uh, Merle Evans, as you mentioned earlier, was one of the catalysts for the group to, to grow and uh, prosper. When he retired from the Ringling Brothers Band, he returned to Sarasota, his home, and continued conducting and touring around the country. And over the course of the 50 years that he read the Ringling Brothers Band, he made contacts in the music business and with musicians throughout the country. Everyone knew Merle Evans. When the circus came to town, musicians from the New York Philharmonic, the Philadelphia Orchestra, 
the service bands in Washington, D.C. would sit in with his band. It was that important and it was that good a musical organization that they wanted to be part of it. People who had that experience treasured the time that they spent with Merle. And when Windjammers first began, one of the, the biggest benefits to musicians was being able to come to Sarasota in January, usually, and play with Merle. When I first joined the group, I, I joined in 1973 when I was very young, I used to come to Sarasota and Merle would conduct the Windjammers band and he would conduct a performance of the Sailor Circus where the performers from Sailor Circus would be in the ring. Merle would be leading a band about the same size as the Ringling Brothers band, about 30 to 35 people. And we would accompany the show. That was circus music come to life and it was circus history come to life. And that was what Windjammers was about. As things have progressed, there are fewer and fewer professional circus musicians or people who have experience of playing in circus bands, but educators, circus music edu or music educators, circus enthusiasts, circus historians have come to the group with the purpose of continuing the legacy of circus music, music that was written by musicians who played in the circus, written for live performance in the circus ring and a unique type of circus oriented music, not just marches, not just waltzes, but characteristic pieces, popular music, all of it designed to make the circus performance more interesting and more vital for the audience. We perform today throughout the country. Normally we're in Florida and Sarasota area in January, somewhere else in the United States in the summer. And we perform for audiences who in general have never heard this music before. So our mission is performance, education, and preservation of this music. All of it comes together in Windjammers. And the Ringling is one of our, our uh, prime supporters and sponsors over the years have furthered each one of those goals. We've done performances at the Ringling in various venues for audiences in the Sarasota area. We've done research in their archives, the Tibbles archives and the Circus Museum to find uh, little known aspects of circus music and circus musicians. And we've done education programs like this one where we provide information to a more general audience, to the general public, about what's important to us and what circus music is all about. Windjammers Unlimited is looking uh, to expand its reach. We are anxious to have any of you that are not current members join the group. I recommend that you come to our website, which is mywju.org. You'll find on the website lots of information about circus, circus music, and the organization. We welcome to have you as part of the group. And uh, it's something that I encourage to, uh, to make your life more interesting in the future. Thank you, Jennifer. That's great. Thank you so much, Don. I'm, I, as we conclude this in a little bit, I will put up a slide that also has that website on it. So there'll be a visual as well. Um, I, I love that you and Charlie both kind of ended or, or began with Merle Evans, that, that there's this linchpin, which again, for me is, is my greatest knowledge. And talking about the Sailor Circus concerts that Windjammers performs, um, I, one of the things that we looked at in preparing for this program, we're showing some of, some of the programs that Windjammers has participated in over the years. So I'm gonna try this clip sharing thing one more time and hopefully I've, I've got a better handle on it. I'm going to show a couple of minutes of a performance that was done. I believe it's 2009 and I am thrilled that Charles Schlarbaum's sister is with us because Charlie was conducting this particular performance. So I think that's a, a nice overlap as well. So I'm going to try and do this now and just share a couple of minutes so that you can see a little bit um, again, as a non-musician, 
I, I think that playing live music is amazing in general, but when you're challenged to play live music, to accompany a performance of another person doing something very physical, you have to know what's happening, know how to anticipate it and to emphasize it. Um, and, and frankly, the added challenge with these kind of concerts is you are doing that for non-professionals, for, for kids who are extraordinary performers for the age that they are, but it's a little less predictable than someone who's been doing the same routine for years. So with that, I'm gonna play just a couple of minutes or not even a couple of minutes, about a minute. So you can hear a little bit of how the music accentuates the performance and the role that it plays transitioning as, as this particular performance wraps up. So fingers crossed. This will work. I should have let it play through that fanfare. But so you can see there what, what happens for, for this particular performer on the Roman Rings, getting down was a little bit of a hurdle. So the, the music really filled the gap and kept the pace of the show going. Uh, I think that that experience for the wind jammers must be extraordinary and challenging and, um, and really embodies th that effort to keep circus music alive. So uh, when I showed this clip to Don and Charlie, they both had had some thoughts about their own experience playing to live music. So I invite you both to, to join me and kind of comment on the clip. Well, this is Don, I'll jump in. And um, I've had the experience of playing in several circus bands, uh, not full time. I, I sat in because of my connection to Windjammers and I knew conductors, but it's the most challenging type of performance because rather than playing a piece of music from the top to the bottom, as you would in a concert in, uh, environment, what you have to do is constantly adjust to the speed of what's going on in the ring, the tempo of other things happening around it, and being able to adjust from uh, a slow piece to a fast piece, uh, adding a chord, changing to the next tune, uh, and, and being prepared for the uh, unexpected. It's, it's a very challenging environment for a musician. At the same time, it's a real pleasure to see it all come together. And Charlie, you've conducted a circus band, so you have a more experience than I. Well, the, uh, the only circus band that I've conducted is the Sailor Circus uh, for the last two years. And I have to say, it's one of the most difficult things I've ever done because you have to be able to shift instantly. And as you're getting toward the end of a piece, you're trying to look up and see what's going on and think, are we gonna to get to the end of the piece before they get to the next big change or before they get to the end of the act? Is it better to go back to the beginning and start over again? Is it better to give a chord and shift to a new piece? There are all of these, um, directions that you have to do on the fly and you've had no preparation for them whatsoever. Um, when, we, when I played in the circus band, you just had to watch the conductor. You pretty much, and one of the only bad things about it is you really didn't get to see much of what was going on in the circus. Uh, you could kind of, if there was a 16 measure rest, maybe you'd get to watch what was going on in the center ring. But for the most part, you were watching the conductor. And when the fist came up, you knew that a B flat chord was coming really quick as soon as he had cut off the music. And then uh, usually you would yell out whether you're going to go to the next piece or whether you're going to go back to the beginning of the one that you had just played. That's great. So I know that we're getting pretty close on time. So I want to leave some time for questions. But before I do that, I'm, I'm not going to show the last clip that I had queued up, but I am going to show everyone here the screen because 
particularly for those of you who are not members and may not be aware of this, there is an amazing program on YouTube that could have filled our, our time here um, in and of itself, I, but I, I wanted to bring real people talking live. In 2015, as part of the Worldwide Circus Summit, the Windjammers put on this circus band seminar. So if, if you look on YouTube for Windjammers Circus Band Seminar, you can find this and you can see it runs 47 minutes total. And this program, the, the musicians are playing, but each piece is introduced. Uh, Connie Thomas, who is a member of Windjammers, gives an overview of what that piece is in the program, the music that's being played and how it was introduced. And then the music is actually played by the performers. It is an amazing program um, and one that I really think we all could learn from. I'm, I'm petitioning already, Laura, that perhaps we can do something like this live when we're able to have the Windjammers in person. Um, but I, like I said, I think that's something I would encourage if you have time on your own and are interested, do watch it because it's, it's tremendously informative. Um, but I want to give us a little time. I don't know if we have many questions in the chat, but I'm, I'm gonna throw out one kind of broad question that we've, we've teased at and, and Charlie definitely you touched upon it as you were giving us that overview of, of history about the really the, the interactions between broader American culture and live circus bands. You know, I, as a historian, I look a lot at how trends were spread through the circus. And I was really, I was dashing off all of these notes as you were speaking. And the idea that Wagner was performed in Rapid City before it made it to the Met, um, I, you know, speaks to that power of the circus to share, to share experiences and cultures in, in culture in ways that maybe 21st century America doesn't always realize. So uh, Charlie, do you have any other thoughts on that or any other really great factoids like it? Well, really, it, it's true. Just the fact that, you know, the, those of us who are bandsmen, as well as performing with orchestras, can be proud of the fact that we all, we've all, we grew up assuming that the orchestra was really the one that brought culture to the people. And it hasn't always been the case. Don, do you have anything to add on? Well, I, I think, uh, you know, Charlie mentioned briefly the influence of the Sideshow Band, which was um, a, a way to bring current and non-traditional music to the frontier, to, to folks who had no exposure to big city life or things that were developing very quickly in urban centers, but the circus, among many other things, introduced jazz and ragtime to a whole audience throughout the country and spread that cultural awareness much faster than it ever would have otherwise. That's great. I, as a coincidence today, I was, I, I get a news feed that has anything with Ringling in it uh, that's been published. And there was an obituary today for Tom, I'm going to get his name wrong, Tomcat Courtney, who was San Diego's godfather of the blues. And this gentleman passed away, he's 91. And he listed within this obituary was the fact that he had joined the Ringling minstrel band as part of the sideshow band. This it would have been based on his age, probably in the early 1940s, that he would have been part of that and uh, then went on to have this very successful career in Delta Blues. And so you get that sense of, of this early exposure to, to broader musical uh, languages, I suppose. And, and that's one of those areas that I think there's a lot more work to be done to suss out how how those musicians then infiltrated across into very, in various other places. Um, Laura, have you, I don't know if you've had a chance to watch the chat. I'm looking to we see. We have a, a very specific question from Terry. Um, do you know what acts may have used the, wow, is it Wacoma March by C.L. Barnhouse? I'm assuming that's a question. Whoa, that's, what, that's one that I don't know. Okay. Um, I certainly know C.L. Barnhouse. He was the most important publisher of circus music in history. 
and the Barnhouse Company is still in Oskaloosa, Iowa, and a very good friend of ours uh, is running it now, Andy Glover. And um, I don't know that particular one, but I can tell you that marches were used for a whole slew of acts and at different tempos and in different styles. Generally, a minor key march would have been used for things like um, lion and tiger acts or uh, other things that would have been considered exotic. Uh, an up-tempo march, uh, a gallop would have been used for things like tumbling acts and things where you wanted a very exciting, exuberant background music for the action that's going on. That's Don't great. see any other questions in the chat, but I would invite any participant, if you want to unmute yourself and just ask your question, you're welcome to do that as well. Um, we did have one question about um, how to access the recording. So we will process the recording on our end, um, and then we will put it up on our YouTube page. We'll also share it with Windjammer so it can you know live on that website as well. So you'll see that um, it takes a couple of weeks for our design team to process the file, but it will be available for everyone um, in a few weeks. Anyone want to chime in? Just, I just wanted oh. to thank you from the 50th, uh, Windjammer's 50th committee. Thank you very much for doing this with us. I'm Joel. Could you hear me? Yes. Yes. I got a question for Charlie. Um, I look at the pictures of the bands very early, 1920s, and Sells Floto, Hagenbeck, Wallace, they had like over 20, 25 pieces. And I'm old enough, so I remember Zach Terrell's Cold Brothers and the Beatty Rail Show with uh, Fred F. Robbins. And those bands weren't over 10 pieces, if that, some of them. When did the shrinkage take place? Was it money or what? Well, actually, there. All along, there had been big circus bands and small circus bands. Even back into the late 1800s, you would have big 30 to 40 piece bands with some of the big shows. And then you might have eight to 12 pieces with the smaller ones. But I would say in general, there were a few shows that always had big bands and Sels Floto was certainly one of them. Uh, Fred Jewell was the conductor there in 1906. Park Prentice was another uh, important Sells Floto conductor. And um, when it combined with uh, Buffalo Bill, Carl King was the conductor of it. So it, it always did. Um, I would say once you get to the 1930s, and I'm sure the Depression had a great deal to do with this, all of the bands except for Ringling Brothers, Barnum and Bailey downsized considerably. And pretty much from that time period forward, I would say the average was from eight to 12. I can remember uh, Cole Brothers, Zach Terrell during yeah. World War II. And that band wasn't any more than 10 pieces, I don't think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that probably, let's see, that probably was Victor Robbins. Right, I mean, Vic as, Robbins, yeah. Vic Robbins as the uh, conductor. And he was known to have one of the greatest of the small bands. And that evidently, I've never heard a recording of them, but it was said that they could really put out a sound that if you closed your eyes, you thought it was a 25-piece group. Um, that they were able to, whether it was orchestrations or you know, how they did it, I'm not sure, but that was one of the- Oh my gosh. Thank you, thank you. Hi, this is Jerry Settler. I have a question. You talked about the, um, how the Circus Jews opera, and certainly we have Pagliacci. Have there been any other operas with circus themes? Oh boy, let me think about that. Yeah, Pagliacci is the one that comes to mind. Um, I'm sure there probably have, but I don't know if there have been any famous Did Anybody else think of another one? I can't off the top of my head. There are a couple Broadway shows um, 
that did. Barnum, probably the, sure. the big one. Great, thank you. I can think of one. Mark, Mark St. Leon here down in uh, Australia. Uh, the Circus Princess uh, in 1932. It's an opera by Carmen. Um, that was uh, performed in Chicago and uh, they had a live, uh, it, it, I, I, I don't have the full story of the opera, but it, it has a circus theme to it. And they had Mae Worth and her troupe do the on stage live circus scene in the course of the opera. Oh wow, that's that's great to know that I I had not heard of that one at all. It's, it's I've heard called, it closer, but called the Circus Princess, but I think the original name of the opera was the Blue Mask, or Blue okay. Mask. You can see in America. I'm going to try to look that one up. Thank you for chiming in, Mark, and thank you for joining us today. It's nice okay. to see you. So I know we're close on time. Are there any last questions from anyone? I am, am so grateful to Charlie and Don uh, for, for joining me in, in this conversation. I think that we could talk about this over many different programs. So I hope we'll be able to add to this in the future, uh, both in person when we're able to, but also this venue at, to have people join us. I, I know that we have Mark from Australia. We have some dear friends from France who have joined us and so many others. Uh, I'm, I'm really thrilled to be able to share this moment with all of you. And I thank you for joining us. Anybody else have any last words? Charles, I have a question. Yes. Uh, it always seemed to me kind of remarkable that when uh, Barnum and Bailey and Ringling Brothers combined, that both Carl King and JJ Rich, and I think Carl King was with Barnum and Bailey and Ringling, and uh, JJ was with Ringling. Right. It was kind of amazing that uh, both of them wanted to leave the road at that point. Or were there other considerations, like maybe they just weren't getting paid as much or something? Well, like that? that's, that's always possible. I, I haven't read any comments from either of those other than Carl King saying that his wife was threatening him that she did not want to be on the road with the circus and that it was time for him to find a job that he could be a, a conductor and write his music but stay in one place. As far as J.J. Richards, I haven't really heard any particular reason why he decided not to accept the job um, because he bounced around for a while during the 1920s. He was a high school band director. He uh, worked at a college. He moved, um, he was in Kansas. He was in several different locations. So he didn't go immediately to another position that would, that he would stay in for any great deal of time. Still quite a few people in this area that remember J.J. Richards. He, he directed the Sterling Municipal Band. Oh, sure, absolutely. Yeah, I heard some good stories. Mm -hmm. I, I can add something from a circus history standpoint. Uh, the, the two shows, Barnum and Bailey and Ringling Brothers, combined in 1919. If you look back to that time frame, what was going on in the same period? World War I and the pandemic, the great flu mm -hmm. at that time. One of the reasons that the Ringling Brothers decided to combine the two shows was because of finances and manpower shortages because of both of those major world events. A lot of people were concerned about continuing with the new combined show because of the threat of the flu still with the disease and also economic circumstances. So Merle Evans, as a young kid, could accept a shorter or a, a smaller salary than either of the previous leaders. And the circus was downsizing, even though the combined show was a massive operation from the two larger circuses they used to operate. So there was an economic consideration. There was a, uh, a world crisis that drove the fact that many people left both of those shows when they combined. It was a convenient time to say, this is my chance to, to do something else and to move into other areas. 
Well, Don, that's that's a great thought. I'll toss out one more thing, kind of the same thing, but specific to music. This is also a real turning point. We didn't have school bands before World War I. We had school orchestras. And this is right at the moment where um, several factors combined to drive out the community bands and replace them with high school bands. I, I love how much I've just learned. Um, I think we probably are at time, Laura. So I am going to wrap it up. But again, I, I'm Don and Charlie, particularly, thank you so much for your time and your expertise. I've, I've learned a lot and I'm going to follow up with questions, I think, so I can learn more. Um, and thank you all again for joining Windjammers. We look forward to welcoming you back to Sarasota next year. But uh, until then, enjoy your virtual convention. And thank you all for, for joining us today. <laughs>